welcome to a very special episode of The Partial Historians. I am Dr. Rad. And I am Dr. G. And we are super excited to have you with us for this very special episode on the women of early Rome. Indeed. We have been looking at the regal period and the early republic for quite some time now, so it's exciting to actually highlight the ladies in our story, Dr. G. So let's get into it. So the periods of Roman history that tend to attract the most attention in popular culture, I think, are the late republic and the early principate. And I mean, what's not to love? I mean, you've got political intrigue, you've got dynamic personalities, the theory of absolute power, incest. I mean, it's everything you could possibly want in terms of that drama mama. Game of Thrones (laughs) wishes it was ancient Rome in this period. (laughs) The Julio-Claudians, Rome's first imperial dynasty, are obviously a particular source of endless fascination for scholars and amateur enthusiasts alike. And one of the reasons why you and I were personally attracted to these periods when we very first started our careers was the prominence of women in this time period. However, what we can see is that as Rome really progressed towards this system that we're talking about in this period is that we had one man dominating the governance of Rome and the eventual establishment of a dynasty. And so female relatives started to acquire new significance in that time period, and therefore they appear in the sources more frequently. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it, how we get these really dramatic moments in Roman history. And when they happen, that's when the women are really at the surface of things. And I think that's fantastic. And yet, unbelievably, that is not the period of history that we've been focusing on uh, for years now. Since about 2014, we have been delving into the story of Rome from what is considered the traditional foundations of the city, as the Romans like to think of it. And this is the story that takes us to Romulus and Remus and the days when Rome was initially ruled by kings. So we're gradually weaving our way through the century that followed the overthrow of the kings. And what we've really noticed in this transition from the regal period into the early republic is that we start to get a really sharp decline in the number of named women in our surviving histories. And this is something that is really fascinating. It's it's got that really big shift of difference from the late Republic and the Principate periods, these sort of eras that happen centuries later where women are back on the scene in a political way. But the kings in this early, early period of Rome, they had mothers, they had wives, there were sisters, there were daughters, there were lovers, there were cousins. And so in that sense, it's got that vibe of the early imperial period as well. The women are bound up in the politics and they're contributing to the political situation in a day-to-day kind of way. They're influencing events. And so we have a bunch of women whose names we know and we have a whole stack of things uh, that are really interesting to think about when we think about women. And so one of the things that we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about this period is that our evidence is often coming from that sort of late Republic, so sort of 500, 600 years later, and that early imperial period. And these sources, they tend to be written for a really specific audience. They tend to be written by really specific people, men. (laughs) And what we tend to find is that elite women sometimes get a mention, but outside of the elite, what we tend to find is that Men don't have names. We're not sure what's happening with everyday women in the everyday sort of situation. If you're not in the elite, you kind of don't get a mention. And that's a big problem for what we're trying to do with understanding the history in many respects. And this is one of the spots where archaeology can sort of dip in and help us out a lot with the material culture, sort of bridging that space. And the other thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about Roman monarchy is that it's not hereditary in the way that we often think of monarchy. There are some relational connections between the kings in some cases, but it's not always so. And that sort of makes this quite interesting as well. Yeah, definitely. I think the other thing that you and I really noticed when we first delved into the regal period in particular, but even the early republic to a certain extent, we are dealing with a very interesting mixture of mythology and history. And it's very hard to tease out 
what actually probably happened and what has been mythologized either over time or in the actual sources that you were just flagging. So people like Livy and Dionysius being our major narrative sources for this time period, and they're writing, you know, literally centuries later, it can be hard to tease out what they've just highlighted or they might have, you know, invented a little bit or embellished a little bit because it speaks to their own time. I think one thing that's always really stood out for me from our research when we covered this period was uh, Gary Forsyth, who highlighted that this period is a bit like a Hollywood blockbuster. It's, it's expertly crafted stories, which you just want to get swept away in, but maybe a bit dubious in the facts department sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, and this is like one of these things which I think is very appealing as a reader of history, where you're sort of like, these are larger than life characters, and maybe all of the things that are suggested that they did, maybe they didn't do. And one of the things that um, we need to hold on to in this moment is that rather than throwing out all of these stories with the bathwater and being like, ah, it's a Hollywood epic. I've seen that sort of sandal film before. <laughs> uh, is to keep in mind that this is how the Romans really thought about their own past. And this is something that we can really hold on to when we start to engage with this material. As much as we might want to chalk up some of these women and their behaviors to literary tropes, and it will be the case with the kings that they get chalked up in that way as well. Uh, there is something about these stories that appealed to Romans about themselves. So we're learning something about how they thought about their past and how they understood their own sense of character. And so delving into these stories is giving us an appreciation for their perspective on things, I think. Definitely. So I think it's time to start delving into it, Dr. G. And you're going to kick us off, I believe, with numero uno, Mr. Romulus himself. <laughs> We're going right back in time. I want you to cast your gaze back. It's 700 and maybe 72 BCE. Uh, <laughs> this is the sort of the hypothetical date for the birth of Romulus and Remus. But I don't want to talk about Romulus. I want to talk about his mum. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. So... Romulus and Remus have a mortal mother. This is important. Um, I know, I know. The, the questions uh, remain about the dad. Uh, we're not really quite so sure about him. Um, but the mother, focusing in on her for a second, she's got a couple of different names. Sometimes she's known as Rhea, sometimes Ilia, sometimes Rhea Silvia. It depends on our source. Uh, but we're thinking pre-Rome at this stage. And we're in the land of the Albans. And there's these two brothers and they're in the elite. And one of them is the king and the other one wants to be the king. And I know. Same old it's story, a same old story. And I should probably really also flag who the Albans are very quickly for people who might not know. Who are the Albans, Dr. G? The Albans are these people who live to the south of what will be Rome. So right. they sort of, they live in this nice sort of, beautiful foothill area. Um, I definitely recommend that you go <laughs> if you're in Italy. It's amazingly beautiful there. And so Alba is kind of south and in a little bit of a hilly section. It's cute. It's nice. Visit. Um, and we have Numitor, who is ostensibly the king. He's been given the kingship. He has uh, gained it from his father. So that's a bit of a hereditary moment. His brother Amulius, though, is really annoyed. Um, and pushes Numitor out of power. And rather than like doing it properly, you would think, because this seems like a prime moment for an assassination. I was going to say, um, what do you mean by doing it properly? How do you just let <laughs> someone properly? <laughs> I think if you're going to usurp a king properly, I think you have to kill him. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. This is not what Amulius does. He allows Numitor to live, and then he goes about trying to curb Numitor's power and influence. So he gets the son locked up. Uh, he gets the daughter, this is Rhea Sylvia, invested as a vestal virgin. <gasps> Your favorite kind of woman. <laughs> I know. For me, a very special group of women. Um, she's forced into the order though. And in being forced, that's a bit of a problem, I suppose. Maybe she was older than she should have been to be forced in there. Nevertheless, that's where she ends up and she has to stay there and what happens 
for her, though, is that we get this what appears to be an incredible story, and most of our sources flag it as such. So this is a story that's recounted to us by Dionysius of Halicarnassus, who is writing many centuries later. It's recounted to us by Plutarch, and it comes to us through Livy as well. And these people are all centuries after the event in question. But apparently one day she's out and about doing things for the cult. And she sits down to have a rest by the side of the river. And she is accosted by a gentleman who apparently is the god Mars. Mm, And Mars Mm. is usually pretty aggressive. So I'm not liking where this is going. He is pretty aggressive. It does not go well. Um, Ray Sylvia comes away from that uh, having been assaulted and... I suppose we should make sure that there is warnings all over the front of this episode for things like that, because stuff like this can happen in the ancient world. And and it it tends to, yeah. Yeah, it tends to. And so this is a problem for her on all levels. Obviously, there's that trauma that comes from that act itself. Then she has to go back to the cult. It's a cult of virginity. This is a problem for her now. So she hides. She was meant to not get pregnant, isn't it? (laughs) Exactly. I mean, that was, and and it's not her fault. And so she's in a situation where things have happened that she's got no control over. She's not sure what to do and she doesn't know who to turn to. She's been cut off to a certain extent from her family, Mm. although she does confide in her mother. Her mother tells her to hide this pregnancy because it becomes clear that. (laughs) What else are you going to (laughs) do? Just pretend it's not happening. Um, Obviously, as time goes on, you've got to have a better story um, because people might notice that something has changed about your body and be like, you know what, you know, I'm I'm getting into the cold. It's, you know, it's hungry work. Uh, (laughs) Got to come up with some sort of narrative. But at some point it becomes so clear and obvious that this is a pregnancy because she is carrying twins. And she's not aware of this necessarily, uh, but this is what is happening. And Amulius's wife does find out about this and she starts to play a part in making sure that there is a guard around this uh, young woman at all times because they want to make sure that those children are taken from her the moment that she gives birth. They are a threat to Amulius's power and they suggest that there's a lineage from Numitor that is continuing, which was exactly what Amulius was trying to prevent by placing her in the cult in the first place. Hashtag epic fail. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Some of our sources suggest that it was actually Amulius who was the perpetrator, oh. um, deliberately so in order to compromise her connection with the cult. Because one of the things that happens with the Vestal Virgins is if you're found to have lost your virginity, um, is that you will be either flayed alive um, or buried alive in this early period. Not a good way to go. Not a good way to go. Yeah. So it is in Amulius' interest to make sure that things unfold in a certain way. Um, It is prophesized at certain points. Uh, in our source material that these children are the children of a god. And Amulius doesn't want to believe that sort of line, obviously. And he takes those children as soon as they are born and orders them to be thrown into the river. This is doesn't really work out the way he planned. No. Um, but to focus on Rhea Silvia for a minute, obviously there is a sort of compounding trauma for her that is now uh, sort of evolving First, it's that sort of violation of self. Um, It is the disruption of her entire life. It is the removal of those children the instant that they are born. And we don't know exactly what happens to her. There's some speculation in our sources that she is removed into a secret prison um, to live out her days. There are other stories that her cousin, so Amulius' daughter, steps in and intercedes for her. Um, and asks that she be taken care of, and she's put into a secret prison but then looked after. And then there are stories where she escapes uh, out of her imprisonment, disappears one day, and ends up throwing herself into the river. And in that moment of throwing herself into the river, the river god Arneo rises up and accepts her, and she goes through a metamorphosis and becomes a goddess herself. 
Wow, that's that's a really interesting end to her story because I've always focused so much, I think, as so many people have, on the men in that story and what happens to them. And I, when I say men, I mean the, the men babies, <laughs> the ones that will become the men that people tend to focus on. But I didn't really think about the fact, until you just pointed it out, that she doesn't actually suffer any of the sort of traditional um, vestal punishments for having her virginity, chastity violated. And this is something that is maybe one of the things in these stories that makes the writers speculate that Amulius had something to do with the original assault. Yeah. Um, Because there is, that doesn't follow through. We know it's the tradition. Um, Dionysius of Halicarnassus flags that to us in the source material being like, look, these are the options. She could either be scourged to death with rods or she could be buried alive. Um, But instead she seems to be, in an ongoing prison situation. Right. Okay. Interesting. Well, I think this is where my lady next comes in. Yeah. Segue, jump into the next lady. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to be talking about the woman who actually raises these babies. So as you flagged, the twins are taken from Rhea Sylvia or whatever her name is as soon as they are born. And they are, the orders are given that they should be killed. And the way that they're going to do this is they're going to pop them in some sort of like basket or some sort of apparatus, put them in the Tiber and let nature take its course. Or as the Romans probably thought of it, let the gods do, do their work. Unfortunately for Amulius, the Tiber had been flooding, as the Tiber is wont to do at this point in time in particular. And so when the soldiers who are sent to put the twins into the river get there, there's kind of a lot of flood water around, you know, they can't really get to the Tiber itself, you know, they're, they're dealing with this flood situation. And so they're like, meh, you know, the newborn babies, why don't we just leave them here? So they just put them, you know, <laughs> far into the water as they can, but it's not as far as Amulius was probably imagining. And they so, went for the close enough is good enough scenario. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and so, of course, what ends up happening is that whilst the babies do float along for a little while, eventually those floodwaters recede and they're essentially left on dry land. Or according to some other versions of the story, they're kind of flung out of whatever apparatus they're in, but they end up on dry land either way. So I don't really care about those sorts of details. And this is the moment, the famous moment. So we've got these two twin boys possibly descended from Mars himself. And they're obviously in a bit of a dicey situation for newborns, even though they're on dry land, they still don't have anyone taking care of them. But don't you worry, Dr. G, a she-wolf comes meandering along and she starts looking out for them. Maybe she licks them a little bit, you know, cleans them up, maybe suckles them a little bit, you know, but she's definitely taking care of them. Now, some of our writers have noticed a bit of a connection between the animal that comes along to look after these newborn babies and possibly Mars himself, because it seems like that animal has a connection to cult of Mars. So perhaps, perhaps the gods are intervening, just not in the way that Amulius was counting on here. And so the story goes that either a herdsman, possibly the king's herdman himself, or a bunch of herdsmen come along, they see this sight and they're, of course, like, what the hell? (laughs) Because you don't always see a wolf looking after some newborn babies. And so there are a number of different accounts of exactly what goes down. You know, maybe they try and scare the wolf away and the wolf is kind of like, "Mm, I'm not scared of you humans, and just meanders away again or whatever happens. But Either way, we do have these men coming along. And one of them is a guy called Faustulus. And he's mm. going to become very significant because he decides that he is going to take care of those children. Now, it does seem like, I mean, obviously, this is the big news of the day. He seems to know that there have been some twins born in the royal family and that they have been ordered to expose. So he seems to potentially kind of put two and two together. And so he decides he's going to raise these children, maybe taking it as a sign that they are meant to live because after all, the gods have made sure that not only did they not drown, but that they were looked after by the she-wolf, right? So he decides to take those babies home to his wife. Now, there are, again, a couple of different versions about who this woman actually is. In Dionysius, one of the reasons why he potentially, I think, decides to take the babies home is that his wife, a woman called Laurentia, 
has just given birth herself and unfortunately her baby was stillborn. And so she's mm. grieving. And yeah. so these twins are potentially a bit of a replacement in his mind for the babies that she has lost. But that's only in Dionysus. And you know that I'm skeptical of the details. So <laughs> I love that guy. Don't take him, don't take him away from me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, he takes the babies home and presents them to his wife. And obviously together they decide that they are going to raise these twins. Now, the interesting detail that is mentioned by both Livy and Dionysius is they actually flag that, well, this story is just crazy. I mean, a she wolf looking after newborns? What's really going on here? And so they're not just accepting this sort of mythological tale at face value. And they both include this later tale that is obviously trying to explain away the sort of fantastical element to this story. And that is that Laurentia, well... Before she got married, Dr. G, she knew how to have fun. Oh, did she now? Oh, yes. Okay. I have nothing on her. <laughs> yeah, so mm, alleg- do tell. allegedly she was either a bit of a good time girl or maybe even as extreme as actually being a sex worker of some kind. And, I mean, let's face it, that wouldn't be out of the question because if we take a step out of ancient Roman morals for a minute, these people are obviously not wealthy. A classic way for women from, you know, not so wealthy backgrounds to make money is by some sort of sex work at some at some point, you know. So I wouldn't put it out of the question that this woman maybe at some point had to resort to that and maybe that's why. The reason why they're mentioning this is because a Roman nickname for a woman who has a bit of a crazy sexual past and has been a bit loose with her favours is the similar kind of word or the same kind of word that they would use for like a, a female wolf, basically. So lupe. And so uh. they think that maybe it's a bit of translation issue. So maybe this woman found the twins or it has something to do with her being their mother. And that's why we get this story of the she-wolf. Maybe. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the story of the woman who helps to raise Romulus and Remus. Interestingly, we don't get a lot else from her um, in in the accounts. We mostly get information about their father, so the guy who originally supposedly found them. We we hear about him again when the twins grow up, so they, of course, being probably the sons of a god, they grow up to be these strapping, very impressive young men. And they end up getting into a bit of trouble when they're about 18 or so. And no surprises there. (laughs) This trouble that ends up leading to their true identity being revealed. And so this is what sets everything on the chain of events where their true parentage is revealed, their connection to the Alb and Royals is revealed. They end up helping to restore their grandfather, Numitor, to his rightful place and killing Amulius. It's during this whole episode, which is obviously one of the sort of famous episodes from the Romulus and Remus story, that we do get mention of Faustulus and some of our accounts coming back. So him being there to give advice. And, and being there to also confirm certain details about, you know, when they were found and how they were found and all of that kind of stuff to try and prove their identity, obviously. So he is mentioned. He is interesting also mentioned in some of the stories about the conflicts between Romulus and Remus. So very famously, of course, they are going to go on to found Rome. During the process of doing that, something happens and Remus dies, gets killed. There are a number of different versions of how that happens, but Romulus is certainly the one left standing. In some accounts, there's an actual sort of battle that breaks out between the brothers and the father, Faustulus, actually throws himself into the fray because he can't stand to see what has happened to his two boys and he dies during that fighting. And Romulus is grief-stricken that this has happened. And Laurentia is mentioned in Dionysius again, comforting Romulus after the death of his father in these circumstances. But that's really that's really all we get. That's as much as we get about her involvement in their later life. And I suppose the only the only other thing I should probably mention is that the Romans would continue to sacrifice to her. So in April there is this um, observance called the Laurentelia which is all about her. So she's important, but we don't get a huge amount of details or family snapshots from the youth of Romulus and Remus and her involvement in that. 
Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? And she sort of is a pivotal figure and yet can be almost seems to be almost largely erased um, from the history. Although we have these really interesting telltale signs of her significance with that ongoing ritual tradition. So that's fascinating as well. So we've got uh, Romulus and Remus, born of a woman, raised by a woman. What next? (laughs) You're going to be surprised to hear this, Dr. G, but when Romulus grows up and founds Rome, he eventually is going to acquire a wife. No way. (laughs) That's who I'm going to focus on next, yeah. So Romulus and the way he meets his wife, or at least possibly his wife, it's probably one of the most uncomfortable episodes in Roman history that we're about to deal with, and it requires a little bit of background to understand exactly how they met. So bear with me here. Mm -hmm. All right, so first of all, I should flag it's debated when in Romulus's reign this actually happens, but he certainly is king of Rome, he's established Rome, and it is early-ish in his reign, I'd say sometime within the first five years. Some accounts seem to indicate that it might have even happened in the first year, which is pretty ballsy, as you will see when I get into it. But basically, Romulus has founded this new city. It's obviously cost him a lot, cost him a brother. Okay, so he wants to make it a success. And a father. And a father, maybe, maybe, yeah. So he's he tries to attract people to the new settlement but by making it a kind of sanctuary for men. So he's like, if you want a fresh start, got a bit of a dicey background or whatever, come and join me in my new city. But it's mostly men that he's attracting by doing this. Like that's what it is. You know, it's a sanctuary for men. And as anybody knows, women are a vital part of the equation for keeping the human race going. Yeah, so eventually they're kind of looking around going, hmm, we don't have a lot of lady friends about here. That might be a problem. (laughs) We might need some of those if we're going to keep this whole Rome experiment going. So Romulus starts sending out feelers to some of the neighbouring cities. Now, this is interesting because it's possible that what he's actually doing here is maybe just trying to establish some alliances, you know, because Rome's nuking on the block. But either way, whether it's because they don't have enough women or because he's trying to establish alliances, nobody is taking the bait. They very much look down on Rome because of its origins and probably because it's a bit new. So nobody's interested. Rome is beneath them. It is the scum between their toes. (laughs) Okay, and it's possible, it's possible, Dionysius does mention, that maybe Rome wanted this response because they wanted to start a war with all the people around them so they could conquer all this territory. Who knows? Anyway. Rome. Romulus is insulted. (laughs) He's not not happy with the response. Yeah. (laughs) So he comes up with a clever plan, Dr. G. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah. He's going to start some elaborate games. Now, in Dionysus, Mm. he even gets the approval of the Senate to do this, you know, goes through all the right channels. But they're going to throw this big festival in honour of equestrian Neptune and invite everyone from the, you know, the neighbouring area. They're promoting it heavily. It's on their Facebook, their Instagram, their Snapchat. Everybody knows about it. And everyone's really excited. They're like, yeah, this is a great idea. We'll definitely come. So a whole bunch of people from a range of cities come, including, most notably, people from the Sabine. Okay, so there are some Sabines in the area who bring their whole families along. You know, everybody's there for a good time. So the games begin and obviously everyone's distracted by what's going on, probably some racing, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then Romulus gives a pre-arranged signal. So it's like the sting. He's like. <laughs> I do love that film. <laughs> the idea that the Romans were doing that, be like. <laughs> exactly. So at this pre-arranged signal, the Roman youth dash around, grabbing whatever women that they can. Oh, that's not cool. I know, I know. Okay, and it's possible that they are obviously trying to target virgins, maybe trying to even target women who are particularly attractive. I mean, there's a whole lot of details that are different about how this goes down. I would kind of put my money on, yeah, probably grabbing virginal, beautiful women if you can. And so this is... This is the episode known as the rape of the Sabines in popular culture. So this is where they're capturing a whole bunch of women, a lot of whom seem to be from a Sabine background, um, and they're going to make them forcibly their wives. That's that's the whole plan here. 
So again, there's a few different details about exactly how this goes down. In some accounts, Romulus has ordered the the youth to make sure they don't touch the women overnight, just give, give them a breather, and then to bring the women before him the next day. And he sort of explains what's going to happen, like, don't cry. We're going to marry you. We're not trying to rape you. We're actually going to make you our wives, which will be awesome. You know, you'll get to have free Roman children and, you know, be a partner to a Roman husband. It'll be great. Just, you know, cheer up, buttercup. (laughs) I can't imagine that would go down well at all. Well, this is the funny thing about history that is being written by men for mostly men. We Mm. don't obviously get a huge amount of detail about what is going through the women's head here. Certainly the women themselves are upset when it first happens, as are their parents. You know, this is obviously a very chaotic scene when it all goes down. And then afterwards, obviously, everyone's still very upset. But Romulus makes it their fault in a way. And and it certainly seems like in this account, they take that blame on as well. He's like, look, if your parents had just agreed to give you to us in marriage in the first place, none of this would be happening. So suck on that. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, we learn a lot about the dangerous undercurrents of Roman patriarchy in this kind of moment, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And they're encouraged to basically just put aside the negative feelings, learn to love the men that you're with, you know, and if you do that, they'll probably treat you better and be really grateful. And so you'll have a much more, you know, a much more harmonious marriage if you just try and go in with a positive attitude, (laughs) goddammit. And the husbands also start chiming in here by saying things like, oh, you're just so beautiful. We just couldn't resist you. And I love the little aside that's included here where they say, and that's the kind of thing that always appeals to a woman's nature. And so the women started to melt. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Yeah. So quite quickly, it would seem, the women are on board. Uh Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm listening. (laughs) Yeah. The catch is their parents are not. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. So the women are like, okay, yeah, we'll make the best of the situation. And okay, yes, I am very attractive. I forgive you. <laughs> but their parents want action. And so they appeal to this guy called Titus Tatius, who's very powerful Sabine king in the region. And they're like, we need to do something about this. Like, it's not okay. Not only have the Romans essentially violated the chastity of our daughters and forced them into this marriage situation, but they've also violated the rules of hospitality here. I mean, this is meant to be a religious festival. This kind of thing does not go down at a Roman, well, sorry, at anybody's religious festival, but this is not okay. And he's listening, he's listening, but the Sabines are quite slow to act. So some people from some of the closest cities that were also very badly affected, they decide that they are going to band together. One of them is your favourite, Dr. G, Crustomerium. Just so I'd throw that in there for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's there's three of them. They decide that they're going to band together and take action because the Sabines are being too, too slow. Of course, however, the Romans are bound to win in this whole situation. And so one, one by one, they don't do it very cleverly. They kind of fight them by themselves, even though they're meant to be in this sort of alliance. And so one by one, Rome beats them. Okay. So it's, it's a pretty uh, pretty sorry effort on their part, in a sense. And so the Romans are obviously conquering this territory and they could be really brutal about it. Now, this is where a named woman comes into account. And it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit unclear about where exactly she's supposed to play a role because different accounts give different versions. But I'm going to start with the earliest involvement on her part. So apparently Romulus's wife was a woman called Hercilia. Okay, and according to some of our accounts, she was quite an elite Sabine woman herself, possibly actually was already married and was either captured by accident or was actually refusing to leave because her daughter had been captured. Not really sure. But anyway, she seems to have become Romulus's wife. So she has been listening to the women who uh, have now been captured and made wives, and they're all really upset about what might happen to their families, obviously, in their cities. They don't want them to be hurt. So they've been talking to her about this, obviously. So that's really interesting that we've got a group of women here, you know, chatting about what to do about a certain situation. And so she goes to Romulus and says, look, could you please find it in your heart to grant a pardon to the parents of these women? I mean, after all, you did kind of do something a little bit wrong there. And could you maybe consider giving them, you know, Roman citizenship? 
because that would mean that Rome itself is stronger. You know, you'll have more people, you know, being a part of this whole experiment that you've got going on. And he readily agrees. He doesn't put up a fight, apparently. He's just like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I will be, I will be merciful. And so he addresses all the women and explains this, that he's going to grant mercy uh, and that they're going to, rather than sort of raise these cities to the ground or whatever, they're going to set up colonies. And this means that there are going to be some Romans who move to those colonies, but most importantly for the women, it means that some of their parents actually come and live in Rome. So we've got a real blending happening in the area with what is happening at this point in time. However, the Sabines are not happy with how all of this is unfolding, okay? They're obviously a fairly major power in the area as well. They're not down with all of this situation. They've also got some women who have been wronged. And so they end up taking action just after all of this has happened. And this is going to be the most serious conflict because they have a bit more of a military reputation than the other places that Rome has had to fight. So they know this is going to be a very serious conflict. And so it, essentially what's up happening, Rome and the Sabines, they go to war. The battle is kind of tight. You know, it's at one point the Sabines pull ahead, at one point the Romans pull ahead. It's a bit unclear about how this is going to go down eventually. Apparently, in the midst of the battle, the Sabine women throw themselves in the midst of all of this. Ah, okay. Wow. Yeah. And it's not because they're angry with the Romans or their parents or anyone. It seems to be their guilt that it's their fault that this is happening, which is... Oh, what? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But, yeah, because basically they're like, oh, you're you're only doing this because of what happened to us and you're only doing this because you're our, our husbands and seemingly by this stage also the fathers of our children so enough time has passed that right okay mm-hmm. yeah that, that seems to have happened so yeah mm-hmm. so they throw themselves in the midst of everything you know they've got crazy hair happening they rent their clothes and they appeal to the armies to please not put them in this situation to not fight over them that you know that surely we can all get along surely we can all be friends because mm-hmm. we don't want to be orphans we don't want to be widows Surely something can be worked out here. And this is so touching that the armed forces agree that they're going to lay down their arms and come to a peaceful agreement. Now, wow. Okay. Again, I should probably flag here according to other accounts like Dionysius, Hercilia actually gets involved in the negotiations, it seems between the Romans and the Sabines and and a whole bunch of other women who she gets together and they make all these sorts of rules about which women can go and talk to their relatives to try and calm the situation down. But the end result of all of this is that that peace is declared and Romulus and Tatius end up deciding they're going to rule together and there is going to be a blending of their civilizations as well and that Rome is going to be the capital, like the seat of government basically. So this is a really interesting situation that's going down here. <laughs> yeah, and it seems that women are at the centre of the political element here, both being sort of like um, shifted around as sort of like political capital to be acquired in in a horrific sense, but then also taking agency once they're in a position to do so and sort of standing up for, for certain ideas and values that they see as relative to the situation that they now find themselves in they're kind of trying to make the best of a bad situation in many respects it would seem yeah I mean I think you and I've talked about this before but once they had been captured I mean there really probably wasn't much that they could do apart from accept the situation just because of the standards of female chastity and you know the the prize of virginity at this point in time so they probably didn't really have much other choice but Seemingly, because they play this role in bringing peace between Rome and the Sabines, they are even more beloved by their fathers, their brothers, their husbands. In fact, apparently, Romulus may have named the 30 Curie, uh, which is like the groupings of citizens that that he organises, after 30 of the women who were from the Sabine group. I mean, I think we've got some doubts on that but hey it's a nice story you know it shows how important they are Uh, and so it's interesting that Romulus's wife is obviously prominent in this story as well in in some way exactly how she's involved is a little unclear but she certainly seems to be the spokesperson of the group yeah she seems to have taken on a leadership role with amongst the women 
Absolutely. And it's interesting as well, the placement of this story, because very quickly I will just flag that whilst we've got this act of incredible bravery and courage on behalf of these women and also, you know, loyalty, all these good qualities that the Romans admire, you know, so much so that they literally stop fighting to pay attention. We also have probably one of the worst stories of female betrayal taking place, and that is the story of a girl called Tarpeia. So, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, when the Sabines are coming into Roman territory, they're in a bit of a difficult situation in terms of occupying a good place, you know, to fight the Romans from. There's not really a good situation for them. And there's this guy called Spurius Tarpeius who's in charge of one of the Roman citadels, one of the very important ones. And his daughter, of course, is Tarpeia. Now, somehow or other, possibly when she's going out to fetch some water, maybe for some religious ceremonies of some kind, um, Tarpeia comes into contact with some of the Sabine forces. And again, there are lots of different versions about how this goes down. Either she is bribed to, to sneak them in or like leave a door open or something like that, or she wants the very fancy gold jewellery, like gold bracelets that they're wearing. She's like, hmm, I want me some of that. And so she agrees that she's going to take that in exchange for laying them in. Or, or she was actually trying to trick them into giving over their shields. So she might have asked for what was on one of their arms and that meaning, I want your shields. And that way she was going to sort of trick them and so the Romans could attack them. It's not exactly clear how we should read her, but certainly she is most famous for this idea of portraying the Romans because the Sabines do, in fact, get into the citadel via this entrance that she leaves open and apparently crush her to death on their way in, either because they don't respect her because she betrayed her own people or because she wanted the bracelets, but instead they like kind of hurl their shields at her and like slam her under the weight of all of these shields. It's it's a very unclear story, but certainly it has been remembered as one of betrayal because famously, of course, there is the Tape and Rock in Room, and that is where people who are considered, you know, to be traitors, or whatever, tend to be thrown off. In fact, I believe there's even one in the Blue Mountains in Sydney. <laughs> Not that we wow. do that. Not that we do that to people. Um, no. <laughs> but interestingly, Dionysius mentions that Tarpeia was actually honoured with a monument in the spot where she died. So, mm. yeah, it's a bit hard to. I wonder, I wonder if the rock figures into that. Presumably it would in the stories. Yeah, so it's a bit hard to know exactly what to make of that story there yeah the Tarpeo story is very complicated and even more complicated by Propertius um, one of the poets under Augustus who labels her as a vestal and so sort of puts the whole sort of safety of the city in this realm of uh, the relationship with the gods as well so it does become a really complicated tale um, for Tarpeia um this is, I think, an opportune moment to sort of um, also note that Persilia, um, in some sources, is credited as becoming a goddess um, mm. upon her death. So we have the death of Romulus um, and he becomes Quirtes. Uh, <laughs> we're like, okay, uh, he disappears and they make him a god. And when Persilia dies, she apparently also becomes a goddess, um, Hora, um, and they're connected forever. So something about that relationship just transcends time and space. <laughs> it is really interesting because it does seem like she has a certain level of agency, although, of course, Romulus holds all the cards. But I think the interesting contrast that's been highlighted in a recent book that I've read by um, Peter Keegan is that you do have Hercilia exhibiting kind of masculine traits of, you know, of courage and, and wit, you know, wittles in a sense. Like, I mean, wittles is a masculine trait, but she is exhibiting these sorts of, this sort of bravery as other women around her. And that is seen as being something that leads to positive results for Rome and the state because they, of course, get peace with the Sabines. You know, Rome isn't destroyed. Not that it probably was going to be, but it was a bit of a dicey battle, you know. They, so they get all these good things for Rome, whereas very female traits like the ones that Tarpeia probably exhibited, like wanting the jewellery and maybe lusting after Titatatius. It's a bit unclear what exactly she was after. But whatever she was after, it's definitely something that's distinctly feminine. And that leads to disaster for the state. Yeah, this this gets into the sort of the complications about the way that Romans really have a strong polarised view of gender and gender roles. 
And this will come into play in some of the stories coming up as well. Um, so we're going to move into the rule of the second king of Rome. And this is Numa Pompilius. And Romulus gets um, murdered slash disappears at the, at the end of his, can it be his time. <laughs> uh, it can. Um, he kind of vanishes in front of everybody during a flash thunderstorm and everyone, the senators are all like standing in a line being like, where did he go? And people are like, is he behind you? And they're like, no. <laughs> um, and so there's this sense in which we're not sure how Romulus uh, goes. Um, but the kingship is over and Rome enters uh, what is called an interregnum. So they have no king for a certain amount of time. It's a little bit disastrous because it's the first time that this has happened to them. There isn't a clear line of succession. If people were looking to Romulus, he didn't have any children. So albeit the marriage to Hercilia has happened, it hasn't been fruitful in a way that would lead to a hereditary monarchy. And so they set up a situation where the lower magistrates, the senators sort of rule uh, in sort of groups um, and they sort of tag team each other. And after a while, they make the decision that there can only be one person who can be king and that will have to be Numa. Um, Titus Tatius is also dead by this point, and we should, <laughs> should add. Um, and so they, but Numa is also from a Sabine background. So this is a really interesting moment for the Romans. They're like, they've looked at themselves and gone, there isn't anybody here who's worthy enough to do the job. We'll have to look further afield. And because of this intermingling of the Sabines and the Romans in the city at this point, that seems like the next best option. And Numa is the very almost polar opposite of Romulus. Romulus is known for being sort of a gung-ho warrior, getting in there. He'll fight for what he wants. If he doesn't get it, he'll create a war, all of that kind of thing. Numa, on the other hand, is like this philosopher who kind of sits at home and studies a lot and sort of says wise things to people, uh, which is very impressive. But it seems that maybe his biggest claim to being the next king of Rome might be the fact that in some of our sources, he's thought to have been married to Tartia, the daughter of Titus Tatius. Hmm. Mm, convenient. Yeah, um, the old connections. And the old connections. And Tartia seems to have been quite open um, to moving to Rome. And Titus Tatius has a good reputation and legacy there. Um, so obviously she's lauded as his daughter in Rome. Um, but the road of marriage ne'er runs smooth. <laughs> and as far as we know, at some point, Tardia just dies. Um, Numa and Tardia have been married for a while. Um, they were married for 13 years, according to Plutarch. And then all of a sudden, whew, she's gone. Um, and from that point onwards, Numa's relationships become somewhat more questionable, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> So he goes on um, to sort of start to rule the city through trying to create more legislation. He wants Romans to have an understanding of their relationship with the gods in a really significant way. He sets up a whole sort of situation with the god Janus, um, whose doors open and close, close when there's peace in the realm, open when there's a war. So there's a nice symbolic factor there. And he tries to keep those doors closed. He was like, guys, we need to focus on ourselves right now. It's about building from within. <laughs> um, you know, the neighbours, you know, we don't have to fight everybody all the time. And everybody uh, kind of was on board with this, but it seems like Numa needed a little extra punch in his uh, toolkit to get people on side with this kind of stuff. And one of the things, and our sources tend to speculate that he does this deliberately and he's making it up, is that he says to people that he is consulting a goddess in the forest. As you do, yeah. As you do. <laughs> and that's where he gets his best ideas. That's how it works. Yeah. And her name is Egeria and she's known as a nature goddess. She's not considered to be highly significant, so she's not like 
like the Romans think of these gods in a type of hierarchy. You can have different levels of divinity. She's not <laughs> at the top of the tree, um, but she's embodiment of nature and she's part of the forest. And Numa goes walking in the forest quite regularly. And there's speculation that uh, he's having a divine entanglement uh, in the forest. Things are happening in there that nobody should really talk about. And yet, um, and she, <laughs> she seems to be the source of all of his great ideas. <laughs> now, I really want to believe that there is a woman called Nigeria. I think that would be fantastic. It is not a question in my mind at all that a woman would come up with some great ideas for how to run a place. Um, so I'm hoping that she's real. But our sources really want to dismiss this as being significant. They're like, there's no way a goddess would sleep with a mortal guy. Guys are too gross. This is basically what Plutarch says. He's like, there's just no way. What goddess would demean herself with a mortal body? He's clearly batting way above his average. Exactly. Yeah. She's I mean, like a 10. She's uh, like so out of his league. Yeah, pretty much. And it's like the, like the disparity between these two is huge. Numa <laughs> at this stage must be in about his 50s because he doesn't become king of Rome until he's in his 40s and of and he comes there with a wife and this sort of stuff crops up after she has passed away. Right. So Egeria seems to be responsible for a whole bunch of things that really improve Rome across the board um, because some of the ideas that Numa implements during his reign include a whole array of religious magistracies. So this is where the Pontifex Maximus comes from. This is where we get the Flamens, we get the Salii, we get the Vestal Virgins set up in Rome under Numa, by all accounts. And all of these things are basically credited to Egeria. So she's got this amazing, pivotal, structural role in the improvement of Rome's systems. But our sources really want to uh, dismiss that the possibility that she could be a real person and that he could actually be consulting somebody in the woods. And maybe he had to say that it was a goddess because it lent a little bit more credence and a little bit more persuasiveness to the sorts of things that he was trying to get done. Rather than just saying, uh, my girlfriend really thinks that it would be a great idea if the Vestal Virgins were in Rome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and everyone's like, why? <laughs> uh, so he does this and it seems that he is the, the one who sort of propagates this story and it's dismissed as kind of like a, a political gesture to try and give some credence to things. But at the same time, it seems quite likely, given Numa's sort of philosophical connections, that he does have a network of people that he does consult. And even if Egeria as a single entity isn't necessarily real, mm. there's no reason why he might not be going into the forest and consulting with a whole bunch of people, men, women, otherwise, any of any type, any human uh, in that forest and having a chat to learn about some best practice and to think about what might be appropriate in this challenging warlike settlement that he is now the king of. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So Numa has a pretty peaceful reign, doesn't he? He does. Um, there are some suggestions that war might come to him and because he's so peaceful focused, he's not really prepared for that. Mm. The sources are a little bit murky on that front. Yeah, uh, but well, generally speaking, there's a lot less conflict under yeah. Numa than there is under Romulus. Well, you know what? I'm a true Roman, Dr. G. I bleed Rome. And therefore, I think it's time that we have a proper warlike king again. And oh. it's time for the third king of Rome, Tullus Hostilius, who takes over after Numa. He's much more a Romulus type like character, famous for his wars. Yeah. <laughs> Now, right. <laughs> he, might thinking, he might be thinking I'm going to tell you all about his wife and kids, but I can't, unfortunately. We don't have much information about them. I know that he was married and that he did have children, but mostly what I know is that after reigning for apparently quite a long time, like about 32 years, we also the traditional chronology would have us believe, he perishes in a house fire and so does his whole family. And that's about what we get oh. yeah 
It's pretty horrible. Mm. Um, there are a number of reasons why this fire is reputed to have started, however. One of them is, of course, classic Thunderbolt, just like Romulus, uh, probably because he was paying too much attention to war and not enough attention to the gods and religious observances. Or, and this is brings women into the situation again, Potentially, this guy called Ancus Marcius, okay, he is the son of Numa's daughter, okay, felt that he deserved to be royalty and therefore he wanted to make sure that Tullus Hostilius's children were out of the way. And so he set the fire. And again, we've got that familial connection happening through the women. And interestingly, mm. Tullus Hostilius potentially was descended from Hercilia himself. So we've definitely got some potential familial connections here coming through the ladies, which is what, you know, as we said at the beginning, makes them so important in the Julia Claudian dynasty, you know, these family connections that happen. The main story that I'm going to tell you about, though, is about someone who's not a part of the royal family for once, okay? And that is the story of uh, Horatia, okay? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. So one of the most famous wars of Hostilius's rule is war with the Albans, which is super sad because, of course, the Albans... They're like the brothers of the Romans. So it's very, very sad when it happens. But it seems that there's been some raiding going on, peasants raiding each other's territory. We're not going to focus on that part, so I'm not going to worry about it too much. But eventually a war is going to happen because of this raiding that's happening. Now, depending on which source you read, there are numbers of ways that these three triplets on the Roman side and the Alban side come to prominence. So... In some accounts, it just happens that the Romans have a set of triplets of about the right age, and it just happens that the Albans have one too, and that just seems like good luck. And the kings suggest, hey, what if instead of having this big war where lots of people lose their lives, we have representatives fight on our behalf, and hey, those triplets, they seem like good candidates potentially. In other accounts, there's a whole, there's a whole detailed like family history where these guys are cousins, and so they're both, you know, mm. they're both the children of sisters. It's it's a whole thing. But anyway, whichever way you want to go. Obviously, cousins, it's a little bit more heartbreaking, perhaps, that they're forced to fight each other. Anyway. But also makes sense with triplets because it's very rare to have triplets. Um, and, That's true. And there might be a genetic predisposition that runs through a family for it. That is absolutely true, yeah. So it's in Dionysius that they're cousins, of course. But anyway, so what ends up happening is a big showdown happens. Obviously, everybody's watching. It is epic, you know, one by one. They're injured. They fall. Oh, you know, it's all very dramatic. But what ends up happening is that we have one of the Roman triplets and they're probably, we think that their name is the Horatii. So yeah, probably one of the Horatii ends up managing to defeat all the other triplets. They're all dead. And so unfortunately his brothers are too. He's the only one that gets to return to Rome, but he's obviously pretty chuffed that he's managed to secure this victory for Rome. So he returns home. He's got all of his spoils that he's taken. So all the armor and equipment from the fallen, he's got that with him. And he's like, yeah. And so all these Romans are flooding out from the gates going, oh my God, you're so amazing. Oh my God. Oh my God. One of them is his sister, who of course is called Horatia because the Romans are just super imaginative with their names. Now, when she sees him, she apparently recognises that one of the cloaks that he has got as part of his spoils was a cloak that she had made for da, 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 her fiancé. Ooh, yeah. okay. That's right. So she was apparently engaged to one of the Curiatae who is from the Alban, from the Alban side. And so she recognises that this is a... This is his, and therefore that. Oh, must... he's just killed her fiance. Yeah, and of course, obviously, her brother has survived. So obviously, that also means that you know he's he's probably won the battle, and so she is devastated. So she starts carrying on, you know, the whole the whole deal, messing up the hair, you know, scratching the cheeks, you know, doing the whole thing. Horatius is absolutely furious. Now, in some accounts, he had actually been furious that she'd even been outside to greet him, but she was like, "I'll let that slide because you're a woman, and therefore." don't think. Uh, and, you know, my victory is impressive enough that it might have caused you to, you know, forget, forget, forget what you should be doing here. And so he's willing to overlook that, but he is not willing to overlook this betrayal, not being sad about her brothers being killed, not being happy that one of her brothers managed to bring home the victory for Rome. And so he kills her right on the spot oh, oh. yeah yeah mm. this is Not crazy cool. yeah and That's so, very distressing 
Yeah, he really tells her off. He's like, how dare you? In Dionysus, he even says that she's a pretender to virginity. Because like, oh, she's what? outside or something. But anyway, he's like, you hate your brothers. You're a disgrace to your ancestors. You are mourning an enemy of Rome and therefore you should die along with any other woman who's like you. Wow. Yeah. Now, interestingly, you might think that, oh, well, okay, I guess that's what how the Romans feel about those sorts of things. But people are definitely <laughs> disturbed by this event, which is good. I think. This is this is bad because that's family blood as well. It's it's not Absolutely. a not a good look. Yeah. So whilst they want to celebrate him and be like, yay, you're our hero, they're a bit more like, woo. <laughs> now because clearly they have to deal with the fact that blood has been shed i mean murder is obviously not not acceptable in terms of you know the pollution that that brings and that kind of thing but obviously as you've highlighted being the murder of a sister this is particularly problematic now there are a couple of versions of how things go down i won't get into the ins and outs of his trials but whichever account you look at it is definitely his dad that ends up coming to his rescue because people clearly feel like he should be punished in some way they're just not sure how to deal with it but his dad comes out in both accounts at certain points and says look i would have done the same thing this chick be crazy he's not at all happy with the way that his daughter has behaved but i think you can also see what's going on for the dad if if his son were convicted potentially the penalty would mean that his one remaining child would also be taken from him as well like what if he was to be executed or something like that you know who knows and so we can probably sympathize a little bit more if we think about it from that angle, I suppose. But certainly the dad comes out and says, look, quite frankly, she was justly killed. I would have done the same thing. And he even takes it more extreme in certain versions where he doesn't even allow her to have like a proper burial and that sort of thing. So essentially Mm -hmm. what they end up deciding is that they'll just carry out some rites, which will help to sort of lift the the pollution and, and, and deal with that side of things. But he doesn't really suffer any consequences beyond having to go through this, like some form of a trial and uh, and then go through these rites to you know purify the situation. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That is a shocking story. I have it to say, it really is. Yeah. And the way in which this tells us something about patriarchy in Rome, for sure, um, and tells us something about the relative value that is placed on children depending on their gender. Mm. um it it is horrifying and I mean it's it's a process of mourning and and grief for Horatia um and to be cut down in that moment I think is horrifying on every level um yeah I think this speaks badly to the sort of values uh that the Romans hold in contrast to uh the values that might be at play in other societies of the same time period but yeah the Romans are telling this story I guess for very particular reasons as well well it is interesting that we do have a even though it's a a a male and a female in this case it is another story of blood being shed between siblings just like Romulus and Remus isn't it Uh, but in this case there are there are some consequences even though they're not perhaps super extreme but there are some consequences for the perpetrator whereas Romulus doesn't really have to pay a cost for killing Remus. So it's interesting that that is happening. And I think there's a sense in which there is something to be said about the way that there was an alliance that was about to sort of be formalized between these two families as well. So one, the decision to take those two sets of triplets and ask them to fight each other when they would have known that this agreement was already in place. Well, Um, yeah, that's why in some accounts like Dionysius, there's a lot more about the, the family connection and about is it moral to write, you know, to ask these two sets of triplets to fight each other? Like, should we be doing that, forcing them to do this? So there, there's a lot more debate about that in Dionysius than there is in the Livy. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Look, I'm not surprised, to be honest. <laughs> All right. So that, that I think that wraps up really nicely the third king of Rome and what's going on there. I'm going to swiftly move past. Ancus Marcius, who does get his time to shine in the sun um, as a king of Rome, the fourth king. Um, We know he has a wife and a couple of sons. We literally know almost nothing else about the women during that period. 
Um, but what I would like to do is take a moment um, to uh, sit a little bit with the story of Tanaquil. And Tanaquil is connected with Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. And he is going to be our fifth king of Rome. He doesn't start off that way, obviously. One isn't born to it uh, in the <laughs> Roman style. Um, he lives in Tarquinii and he is a sort of a, an up and coming sort of ambitious lad in a way. And this is a sort of an Etruscan uh, area as well. So we're not talking about Rome. We're talking about somewhere just sort of to the north. And there's these two brothers and one of them inherits and the other doesn't. And young Lucamo, as it were, manages to snag himself a great marriage, but not a great deal of wealth. He sort of gets left out a little bit. Um, but he does make this good match with this woman, Tanaquil, who does come from a very prominent family in Tarquinii. And she is descended from the foremost members of their Senate, et cetera, et cetera. And they share a connection in terms of their ambition, um, these two. They're kind of like, they remind me a little bit of uh, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. They've got that sort of like, oh, yeah, we know what we're about. We know what we want. We've got a thing. Let's go and get it. You know, whatever the cost, let's do it. And so they're pretty wrapped up in like what they can achieve together. And they decide that maybe it's a good idea to leave uh, Tarquinii because their chances of making it ahead are just not that great. And it's like, you know, Lucamo's other brother got all of the goods. Um, they're going to be fighting from the bottom. She's got this sort of background reputation for being from a great family, but she doesn't have the goods herself right now. So she's like, why don't we strike out and find some land of opportunity where we can really pursue our dreams? And he's like, tell me more. And she's like, <laughs> I'm thinking Rome. And he's like, yes, great idea. So they pack up shop and they trundle down to Rome and change their name on the way, basically. They're kind of like, you know, let's, uh, we need to roam it up a little bit. <laughs> um, and as they're reaching and approaching the city, they have a moment. And so Livy tells us this fantastic story um, where we get a sign from the gods. And this is something, yeah, I know, the gods, <laughs> they send a sign. Um, and this is fantastic because, I mean, for a god to send a sign, it's always a natural phenomena. It's something that happens that is unusual or out of kilter with the expectation. Uh, and your ability to interpret it depends on how you've been trained. Mm. And Tanaquil has been trained in the Etruscan fashion and she comes from this noble line and it's thought that the ability to read these things is one of these things that's passed down through these lines as well. So she has this training um, in the art of sign interpretation. So they reach a spot known as the geniculum. And if you go to Rome today, you can go to the geniculum. It's right uh, near the center, actually. But in the olden days of this early period, it's not near the center at all. It's this hill that sort of looks out over what will be the settlement of Rome itself. So it's at a little bit of a remove. So you've got this great view of the city and a, a eagle swoops down all of a sudden and takes off Lucamo's cap uh, and, <laughs> and is like brushes down, grabs it, the little beak <laughs> grabs it, uh, swoops back up again, circles around crying out rah, rah, rah. Um, and then carefully brings the hat back down and puts it back on his head. Rah, 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 rah. What a clever bird. <laughs> Amazing bird. And this is a moment that Tanical just lights up. She's like, oh, this, this is special. This is something. And she's like, she throws her arms around her husband. She's like, this is a prodigy. We've seen something. You're designed for great things. The eagle has seen it. And this means that there will be a crown eventually on your head, you know? And so there will be a replacement of this cap with something far greater. And the eagle is a very highly symbolic bird for ancient Rome. 
particularly for the writers who are writing back to this regal period. Yeah. And so the eagle has really taken on a whole uh, sense of multiple symbolisms by the time these people like Livia are writing about it. I just realised you could say the eagle has landed. <laughs> You could indeed. Um, briefly, for a moment in time, on the head of Lukavu. And so they're super excited about this potential. They're like, oh, this this says so much about what is possible for us. It's like, this is incredible right now. And so this is like the first instance where Tanakul has this sort of pivotal role in uplifting uh, Lukamo's spirits. So Lukamo renames himself Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. Um, he starts doing things in Rome, getting about, meeting people, making connections. Um, they're both pursuing their ambitions and it's going well. Um, he makes connections with Ancus Marcius, does some good stuff there, um, and ends up sort of being the custodian of the will. So that's nice. Um, and nobody really thinks too much more of that, but the thing is <laughs> that being the custodian of the will sort of puts you in a great position to be like, guess what the will says, guys? <laughs> yes, what it says. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. Um, and through a series of events, which uh, I won't delve into here, it ends up being the case that Lucius Tarquinius Priscus gets to be the next king of Rome. And he has Tanacle by his side. And that's fantastic. And... You would think that would that might be the end of it. You're like, ah, she's done some great work. She's yeah. seen the signs and it's all happened. Yeah. <laughs> she's seen it. It's it's all come true. It's great. But she keeps seeing things. And it's kind of amazing what she what she then gets to see. Does she so, see dead people? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I kind of wish that she did, but she <laughs> uh, it doesn't really quite go that far. Um, but a second notable instance of seeing things does happen. Mm -hmm. And this happens when they, they take in um, a slave girl. Um, and when I say take in a slave girl, clearly they own a slave, uh, an enslaved person. <laughs> and this is not uncommon in ancient Rome. And she does have a name as well, um, or Cilia. And one one thing that happens and, and might not be very believable, but let's see if we can make it work. One day um, in the house of Lucius Tusquinius Priscus and Tanaquil, uh, an enslaved woman, a young woman, sees a phantom phallus in a fire. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag phallus Thursday. Follow us on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> We're out there. Yeah. Um, and... She rushes off and she goes to Tanaquil and she's like, what, what is going on with the fire? <laughs> like, it's like, that's very odd. Um, Tanaquil comes in and is like, interesting, interesting. Bear with me. Yeah. I think this is important. I think you need to stay in this room and make some magic happen. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That, that's her, that that's her ring. That's what I think it means. Yes. Yeah. A child is born of this union. Of course, of course, yep. <laughs> he's known as Servius Tullius. Yeah. And he's raised in the family as an enslaved child, um, as is the tradition um, in Rome. And so there's a sense that that's one story, that's one reading of it. Another one happens when Servius Tullius is quite young and he's asleep. And so... In this scenario, the child doesn't need to have a sort of a weird origin story. Mm. It could just be that there's a different prodigy and a much more realistic way that this child came into being. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the child is sleeping and Tanaquil walks in and sees another vision. His head is enveloped in flame and... And it's not just her who sees it. Other people can see it as well. So it's not like she's just hallucinating other people. She's like, can you see that? And people are like, that is very strange. That is weird. The child is not on fire, is still asleep, and yet the flames around its head. She's like, hello, 911. I'm on fire. <laughs> <laughs> What's your emergency? <laughs> I'm too hot. Um Everybody sort of is like, what is going on here? And um, 
they have a look and Tanaquil's kind of like, I think, and she doesn't say this in front of everybody, everybody sort of just calms down normally and sort of like it recedes and everyone's like, ooh, what could it all mean? What could it all mean? And Tanaquil's kind of like, I know what it means, but I'm only going to tell my husband. <laughs> uh, Wait till she gets him alone. She's like, keep an eye on the child. <laughs> He's going to be important. Or as the Romans might say, important. <laughs> Watch that child carefully. Uh, we will need to keep him close. I sense big things for him. Yeah. And Lucis is like, you know, I, she can read things. It's worked before. I Obviously, I believe her and trust her. So they do. They keep Servius Tullius close. And this is fascinating because then this kind of segues into what becomes a whole bunch of political stuff. Yeah. Because Lucius Tarquinius Priscus does die. Right. But he dies at home and okay. Tanaquil covers it up. Ooh. Yeah. Um, because her favorite reading of how this situation should play out is that Servius Tullius should become the next king. Mm. That's her understanding of the vision. She's going to she, stage mum this, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> she's going to take everything. Yeah. And so it would seem that Ancus Marcius's sons should probably have some sort of say in what's going on here. They don't. They're upset. Um, and they want back in on like power and kingship and stuff like that. She does not want that for this family. Yeah. She doesn't seem to have a sort of a successive child to offer into this scenario, hmm. which again, it seems to be one of those things that happens again and again with these women in this early period where it's like it's not a hereditary kingship yeah and you can't just pretend even if you have a child that that child is going to step in yeah it's not how it's going to work it has to be a selection process that the people approve of and she wants to make sure that the people have enough time to approve of a former enslaved young man uh, to be chosen as the appropriate king yeah. So she does some stage management for this. She pretends that Lucius is just unwell. She's like, look, we've had to close the door because, you know, he just needs some quiet time. <laughs> yeah, somebody behind the door coughing every so often just to keep up the ruse. She's like, don't go in there. He's ill. I don't know if it's his deathbed, but we can't be sure. And I'll check on him. Don't worry. And in the meantime, she has Servius Tullius running around sort of making connections, um, drawing together alliances and stuff like that. So when the moment finally arrives, when she feels like he's in a strong enough position to take on that role, she opens the door and is like, oh no, <gasps> my husband is dead. <gasps> Gasp. <gasps> and, you know, cries, rents, yeah. hair, etc. It all <laughs> happens. Yeah, yeah. And draws on some tears. <laughs> put some onions underneath, goes the whole hog. And we're, I mean, obviously there's grief involved as well, but we get this sense that she is really playing for a particular angle politically to work out. And it does. And so one of the things that's really fascinating about her story, one of the things I've been delving into is what can we really learn about Tanaquil from the way that she's brought into the source material? Because she doesn't seem like a sort of a likable character necessarily. She doesn't seem to fit that mold of uh, Roman matrona in a positive way. That, mm -hmm. um, and yet she becomes a really positive figure in some of our sources. And we have to wonder why that is. And I was reading a great article by Gretchen Myers, who is getting into the material culture and what can we learn about Etruscan women from thinking about Tanaquil and her representation in the sources. And one of the really interesting things that we get coming through, not until one of our very sort of late sources, um, Pliny, um, writing in his Historia Natura, talking about something that Varro tells us. So Varro is kind of in that sort of Augustan latish period as well. But Varro apparently tells us that Tanaquil is known as a spinner and weaver of garments. Oh, okay. And not only that, that there is wool from on the distaff and spindle that belong to her that have been preserved in the Temple of Sanctus. So it has lasted 500, 600 years. 
and has been preserved. And also that in the Shrine of Fortuna, there is a pleated garment that is on display that was made by her and it was worn by Servius Tullius. Wow. So, and to me, this is a a fascinating moment because there is a whole bunch of sort of literary tropes associated in the ancient world with women as spinners and weavers. We get it with Penelope, most particularly in the Odyssey, Um, but there are definitely others. But this is seen as um, quintessential female labour in the ancient world. And one of the uh, sort of really um, sad things for us, I think, as people who study the ancient past is that that sort of material culture tends not to survive. Yeah. Um, And so a lot of what women produce in the ancient world, we have to wonder whether it has lasted or not. Yeah. And if we're thinking about clothing, it's usually a case of, no, it hasn't. Yeah. And then we have this amazing example where Varro tells us that actually some things have lasted for quite a long time yeah. and they have preserved them and they do connect them with Tanaquil. So she gets this idea of weaving and spinning attached to her as somebody who makes clothes. And in this way, we can start to see how she might be um, being paired up um, for a, an ideal comparison with somebody like Livia. Yes. Who is known famously or infamously, depending on your perspective, as making all of Augustus's clothes Yeah, in that much later sort of the cusp of the imperial period. That is actually really interesting because if we go back to the Sabine women, in some accounts the only labour that they were permitted to do as part of the sort of peace settlement between the Sabines and the Romans is spinning, is, is, wow. is working with cloth. So yeah. that's really interesting, yeah. But yeah, you know yeah. what, I think it's enough of these spin doctors. <laughs> I'm going to stay in the reign of Servius Tullius, um, Tullius, but I'm going to fast forward to the end. So obviously he's a bit of a controversial, interesting king because of his supposed background, the way he comes to power, essentially kind of being chosen by a woman at first. And so very interesting. But I'm going to fast forward to the very end. So he rules for quite some time, like a quite some time according to the chronology Um, and by the time he's getting into his later years as a king one of the children of Tarquinius Priscus he has a couple of sons and one of those sons is starting to go around claiming that Servius Julius has been reigning without the proper assent of the people and he's not half wrong in the sense that Servius Julius is a usurper our sources make no bones about that he is clearly a usurper who's gone around the usual way of doing things by this stage in the regal period so this is a very confusing story and there's all sorts of mathematical gymnastics involved to say that a son of Tarquinius Priscus is around in this time period after so much time has apparently passed. Like there's a lot of a lot of questions we could raise, but I'm not going to go into that. So essentially there is a bit of a, a battle going on between Servius and Tarquin about who has the right to rule. Because Tarquin seems to feel hard done by that he doesn't have a, a more formal position or he doesn't have sort of royal power himself. And Servius does seem to be making moves to win over maybe more the common people than the elite. And so Tarquin is kind of getting some support from amongst, I think, some of the elite of Rome, particularly the patricians of Rome. So it's an interesting thing that's going on. Now, where do the ladies come in? Well, this is just my favourite story ever. So Servius Tullius has two daughters by Tarquinia a marriage that was arranged by Tarquinius Priscus before he died. And of course... Surprise, surprise. Yeah. They're both called Tullia. So I'm going to call them T1 and T2. (laughs) And this is where it starts to become like a sitcom. So of the two daughters, one of them, T2, is very sweet, traditional, retiring, you know, very all that, very that. The other one is much more ambitious and aggressive. That's T1, the original. (laughs) The original and the best. (laughs) Now, both of them are married to one of Tarquinius's sons. And wouldn't you know it, they have the same personality divide. One of them is very moderate, very prudent, very chill. And another one is much more ambitious and basically a douchebag. (laughs) But wouldn't you know it, wouldn't you know it, they each get matched with the person that doesn't have the same personality as them. 
Oh, no. Oh, this is a tragedy. Guys, you could have fixed that up right at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. So the, the very moderate one, his name is Arons. He's Arons Tarquinius. Okay. So T1, the elder sister, she thinks her sister is a joke. She's like, you should be do it being way more aggressive about your husband's career. You've got this amazing husband who's a real go-getter as opposed to this loser that I'm married to. And so she hates her sister, hates her husband, is getting increasingly frustrated with life. One thing leads to another, and she ends up seriously developing the hots for the aggressive brother, who I'm just going to call Tarquin at this point in time. So, And he feels the same way about her. They're like, we're of like minds, baby. And so they get together, start having an affair, and kill their spouses. Oh, what? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) This is 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 bad bad news, guys. (laughs) That is not the worst. So (laughs) they end up getting together and marrying Either Servius Tullius reluctantly gives him cons- his consent to this match or he doesn't give his consent at all, but mm. they end up getting together and getting married. Once they get married, she is at it. T1 is at it. She is in Tarquinius's ear like, no, 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 no. You should be king. You should be king. You should be king. You should do more. You should do more. You know, she just will not let up. She's like, you know that you've got these connections. You know that you should be making more of them. You know, this is what we're here for. We need to go after the throne and go hard. And so... In all the accounts, she's really, she's actually likened to an infection, like a disease. She plants the seed and it spreads throughout him. It consumes him. She is the troublemaker, definitely, in this situation. And so what ends up happening is exactly that. Tarquin sort of canvasses, gets some support. Even though Servius is is quite popular with the common people, he manages to get enough people on his side that he can kind of make this bold move where he just rocks up in the forum with some armed supporters and when Servius turns up and is like what are you doing he literally picks him up because he's an old man by this stage and throws him out of the senate house and when Servius kind of stumbles away after receiving this obviously sort of beating on behalf of Tarquin who's like I am King Tarquin now he sends assassins to finish the job this this is a total coup and apparently apparently it's T1 his own daughter who suggested that he make sure that the deed is done that daddy dearest is dead we're going to learn from Numitor and Amulia, so we're not going to make that mistake. Exactly. And then it gets even worse. When T1 hears about what is happening, she drives around to the forum and she salutes her husband. She's the first person to salute him as the new king. And he's like, what are you doing here? Get out of here. Beat it. And so she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It does seem a bit chaotic. I will go home. On her way home, she's going down this particular street and her carriage stops and her driver is like, um, isn't that your dad's body lying mangled on the ground? And she's like, go. He's like, what? And she's like, I said, drive, go, go. And so they drive over the body of her father and she goes back to her house with the blood of her father on her carriage. Oh. I know, oh. crazy, crazy. Rome has gotten really out of hand. <laughs> But again, it's so it's so fascinating that a woman is seemingly like such a key player in these in these events here in this coup. Yeah, there's this sense that which uh, Tulia is really a uh, driving force um, for this moment, and it's like it's not that Tarquinius isn't ambitious; he is, but it's kind of like that interplay that we were seeing between Tanaquil and Lucius as well, sort of like. But the ante has really upped where they're kind of like, okay, we're both ambitious. We both want this. How are we going to get it? And I'm really interested in the way in which Tulia has become so uh, disconnected from her own father because she is the daughter of a king. Absolutely. And it's not like she doesn't have access to power in very significant ways. Um, it's, It's not a small thing to be the daughter of the king. And, and yet that doesn't seem to, to be enough for how she feels or I wonder what's going on with that relationship between daughter and father in such a degree to mean that when she gets to that spot where she sees the body and she doesn't hesitate, she's like, just keep going. We're going to drive right over it. <laughs> I have one thing to say to you, Dr. G. 
the world is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm going to now finish up with the probably the most famous Roman woman, one that people have probably heard of. So again, we're going to fast forward a little bit through the reign of this Tarquin. So he, he his coup is successful, obviously. You know, Servus Tullius is dead. So we get this guy coming to power, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, which means basically Tarquin the Proud. He is very arrogant. He continues to be pretty unlikable, but he's not entirely unsuccessful in doing the kinds of things that Roman king would do in terms of, you know, making Rome powerful, you know, waging wars, all that kind of stuff. But the thing that we're mostly concerned about, it happens a while into his rule, okay? So he's not hugely popular because he is pretty arrogant. He is pretty harsh. Uh, he is pretty brutal. But people are, are dealing with it. Anyway, at one point in his reign, after he's been reigning for a little while, there is a campaign against this place called Ardea, which turns into a siege. So basically means you've got a lot of Roman guys sitting around outside, you know, waiting for the action and just trying to starve these people out. And now I'm going to go with Livy's version here because I like it the best. <laughs> so during the siege, during the siege, um, some of the royal princes and members of the royal family are a part of this battle effort. They're therefore in the camp and they decide that they're going to host a bit of a wine party because, you know, what else are you going to do? Why this, not? Yeah. This guy called Colatinus is present and he does seem to have connections to the royal family in some way. And so as they're drinking, their talk starts to turn to their wives and they each start bragging drunkenly about how awesome their wives is. And it gets pretty heated okay now because it, there is a siege going on they decide that it wouldn't hurt if they leave the camp for just a little while to actually settle this bet because Colatinus is like Lucretia my wife she is the bomb she is the best she will absolutely leave your wives in the dust reads them for filth okay and so they end up drunkenly sneaking back to Rome which obviously isn't you know too far away or where or, 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 I mean it's a it pretty it's a pretty big hike from Ardea but sure they'll make it <laughs> well yeah look she's actually probably when I think about it she's actually probably in Calabria but anyway so they sneak back to the house where all their wives are and so one by one they spy on their wives and they're like shh <laughs> And they spy on their wives. And one by one, of course, all of the wives are having a massive party. They're doing things that men are supposed to do, you know, like hang out with their friends, drink wine, which is where Roman women aren't supposed to do, and have a banquet. You know, they're partying on down. Finally, of course, though, they get to Colatinus's house and Lucretia, of course, is sitting there surrounded by her slaves and her, you know, her maids and they're working the wall okay spinning away by candlelight and you know being very virtuous and so you know hands down the creatures won the contest now unfortunately for her one of the king's son a guy whose name is very unfortunately sextus tarquinius he conceives a bit of a i think a bit of a librarian style crush on the creature in that he's like oh she's just so pure i must ruin it <laughs> so typical yeah now, this does go down differently in other accounts, but as I say, I like Libby's accounts. So I'm going to stick with this one. So apparently he decides to return a few days later. So they go back to the camp. He decides, I'm going to come back a few days later. We're family. So she has an obligation to entertain me and put me out for the night if I'm here on business. So he she rocks up. She's very, of course, hospitable because she is the hostess with the mostess. And he waits till it's really late at night and everyone's asleep. And then he sneaks into her room with a sword. And he says to her, I will kill you if you don't sleep with me right now. Now, of course, this is the creature we're talking about. So she, of course, says, um, not going to happen, buddy. This is for my husband and my husband alone. And he says, okay, well, how about if I tell you how much I love you and I lust after you? And she's like, mm, still not happening. Then he says, okay, well, how about this? What if I kill you and then I kill one of your male slaves? put his body into the bed with you and claim that I was just looking out for the family honor and I found you committing adultery in your husband's bed. Then not only will you be dead, you will be disgraced. Now, Lucretia really doesn't have anywhere to go after this. This is, as you were talking about, like this is the patriarchy at work, people. And so she has no choice but to submit, to not make a sound and to let it happen. So it happens. Sextus leaves in the morning, goes off on his merry way. But Lucretia is not going to just let this roll by. I mean, she could have probably. She probably could have told no one about it and maybe gotten away with it because obviously it's not in his interest to necessarily, you know, talk about what he did either. 
but she decides that she cannot live with this. And so in Livy's version of things, she sends for her father and she asks him to bring some, and her husband, and bring some trusted friends. And so when they arrive, she breaks down and tells them the whole story, tells them exactly what happened. And they are absolutely outraged and horrified. But she says to them, I'm really here asking you to promise that you're going to avenge me because you need to bear witness to what happened to me because I'm not sticking around. And she takes out a dagger and they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. And this again is one of the interesting details in Livy. They make a distinction between a guilty body and a guilty mind. They're like, look, you didn't intend for this to happen. This wasn't something that you willingly went along with. You didn't plan it. It's just something that happened to your body, but you didn't actually give consent. Therefore, you're not guilty of, you know, breaking your marriage vows or being unchaste or any of that. You do not have to do this. And she's like, I do. I do have to do this because I don't want any other woman who has sex outside of marriage and, you know, is unchaste. I don't want them pointing to me as some sort of example. I need to do this. And so she kills herself. And she, yeah, it's, it's obviously a horrific scene. Her father and her husband are devastated, absolutely devastated. And they're, they don't know what to do. However, luckily they have brought along a friend with them, a guy called Brutus. Now Brutus is also connected to the Royal family in some way. And it seems that when he was a bit younger, some of his relatives were eradicated by Tarquinius Superbus, of course, as you would do to remove any potential threats to power. And so Brutus apparently has been pretending that he's dumb his whole life so that no one will ever suspect, you know, that he's got any ambition or anything like that. Hence his name, Brutus, which is stupid, right? But he now <laughs> reveals his true persona, which is an incredibly smart political <laughs> operator. You call me Brutus, but really, I'm smartest. Yeah, exactly. And so he takes the, the bloody dagger and he says, guys, there will be time for tears later. Right now, what we need is action. This is it. This is the line. I have had enough mm-hmm. of Tarquinius Superbus and his whole damn family. They have been exploiting the Roman people for too long. They are tyrants and I am not going to have it. And so they end up taking Lucretia's body. They display it for the people, get them all riled up about the crime that has been committed against Lucretia. They remind the people about how this guy came to power, you know, murdering his own sister-in-law and his own brother and then obviously usurping the throne from a usurper, <laughs> Servius Tullius, amongst the other things that they have done, because there are a lot of things that, that they are upset about. And this is the moment when Rome becomes a republic. They overthrow the kings, they kick them out, they banish them forever and swear that they will never have another king again, and they establish the republic. And Bruce is one of the leading figures of that early republic. So Lucretia plays an absolutely crucial role in that transformation of Rome from a monarchy to a republic. Wow. Um, What a way um, to have your life go and what a decision to make as well. Um, This is something that ties in very nicely to Roman ideas of what is appropriate feminine behaviour from their perspective, for sure. Um, But the idea that... Lucretia has gone through all of that as well um, without necessarily um, with the full realisation of the implications that her act would have on the politics of the state um, as well. It's it's quite incredible. It is interesting, though, when we sort of look at Lucretia's actions, again, the way that she's conducting herself while she is upholding a traditional view of femininity she's upholding obviously a view of femininity that has been devised by men and is demanded uh, by men and the way that she goes about it like the bravery that she displays and what she the 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 trade of actions that she sets in motion it is very masculine so again it is almost like it is almost like it it is these sort of masculine side of her these masculine traits that are preserving the well-being of Rome at this moment you know she's not acting like a typical woman you know she's not falling falling to pieces and you know all of that kind of stuff yeah yeah and I suppose the one the thing that I would want to note here as well is that like we're talking a lot in in this episode about masculine and feminine qualities and 
we can see how such a long legacy has been set up for this binary in thinking. Um, And we know it's not true. We know it's a social construct. And women are capable of all sorts of actions. Men are capable of all sorts of actions. They don't necessarily have to be prescribed into particular categories at all. And yet we see the Romans doing it very precisely and clearly. And it has a huge effect on how they think about people and a huge effect on how they think about their own society and the structures at play. And it's important to keep in mind that societies don't have to be this way. Um, And these perceptions are constructed by the people who are living collectively together, and they can be altered and changed. And I think if there's anything that I'd want to take away um, from thinking about the early women of Rome, it's that they have this incredible agency at times and those moments of taking that agency and driving things forward um, really sort of enliven this history and it's like history is not just about men and it's not just about men writing for men and even though the sources we have kind of sit in that kind of realm um, that's not all we can take away from them so I think delving into these women and just focusing in on them for a little while is incredibly insightful and helpful. Absolutely. It wasn't until we actually strung them all together like this that I realized that each of these women is taking part in crafting a a story about who the Romans are. What do they stand for? What do they value? And also, they're often a very crucial part in these moments of crisis in Rome's history, whether it's, I mean, sometimes it's a crisis that they help generate, (laughs) But sometimes it's also something that they they help to repair. And obviously, they still speak to the time in which Livy and Dionysius are writing. I mean, Lucretia is obviously a great example with Augustus. Livy is uh, is writing under Augustus and Augustus is obviously put in train this whole sort of kind of refounding Rome and, and starting again with these more traditional values and this eye of being this idea of being disciplined as being something important for men to have and not allowing your appetites to get out of control and and also for women to uphold very strict moral codes, particularly around sexual behaviour. And I think you can really play, you can see that playing out in the character of Sextus Tarquinius who has given over to lust and, and ambition and, and Lucretia obviously who is upholding that very traditional high moral standard. So you can see that women are a part of that story about who the Romans are, what they value, um, and at also key moments in their history. Yeah, it's just fascinating. And it's been so fantastic to have this opportunity to talk to you about it all. It has been <laughs> an absolute pleasure as always, Dr. Rad. Same here, Dr. G. <laughs>